I was asked to talk about pelvic congestion syndrome as a gynecologist who's been exposed to the vein world. Pelvic congestion syndrome, archaic old term when I went through residency, anything that was kind of sort of maybe not gynecologic, we couldn't figure out what the pain was due to. We set out maybe it's pelvic congestion, but nobody ever did anything about it. It was just put on the chart and we kind of tried to move on from there. What I found is that it's a real condition. There's pathology in symptomatic patients. We have better ways of diagnosing it. We have better ways of treating it. And it's actually a real world condition. And we should be appropriately evaluating and referring these patients because there is treatment available that the gynecologists just haven't really gotten on board with. When you look in our journals, you search these terms and you find so little, it's remarkable. Here's one from 1994. I was in residency then, and this never came into a journal club, never came into a morning meeting, grand rounds, nothing. It comes on page 892 of our green journal. It's from uh, the vascular and interventional radiologist, so not gynecologist, but it's published in OBGYN. They talk about pelvic congestion. They describe it exactly as what we know um, having been exposed to it um, in our venous practice. Everything, heaviness, achiness, odd varicosities, pressure, and what they've done is they've actually treated men for testicular varicoceles, and they have gotten relief in these guys, and they thought, well, maybe we could do something similar for women who have these kind of symptoms. That's a beautiful venogram. Nice big varicosities across the pelvis. So they treated three women, <laughs> and they had really tough criteria for treating them, but they had to have reflux. Their ovarian vein diameter was at least 10 millimeters, so very big, so they didn't get very many patients. But what they found in the three women that they treated, not only did their pelvic symptoms get better, but they had decrease in edema, they had improvement in dyspareunia, they had an improvement in the external varicosities, and of course emotional disturbance because every female problem has to have some sort of hysteria and emotional disturbance. But these patients are, you know, they're, they're mean, they're moody, they're miserable, and they're depressed, but they found just in these three patients that they made a difference. So jump up to 2019, a forgotten disease. I don't know, these folks in Switzerland call it a forgotten disease, but I don't know how you can forget something that you've not really acknowledged. I think it is um, something that is important to look at. And what they did here is they wanted to know of all the patients who came in with um, some sort of symptom and they got a pelvic CT scan, how many of them had dilated pelvic veins and could they go backward and find if these patients presented with pelvic symptoms and maybe they could link the size of the pelvic and periuterine veins and uh, pelvic congestion. So they had 2,384 CT scans that were done at their institution and if women met criteria, their ovarian veins were at least six millimeters, they saw some periuterine or pelvic um, vasculature that was significant size, they went back into their charts to see what they presented with. And the most common diagnosis was chronic pelvic pain of unclear etiology. 12% of patients had dilated veins, 21% uh, were pre, uh, premenopausal, so more premenopausal than post, um, more urinary symptoms. But their conclusions were, well, it's underdiagnosed, it's undertreated, and we need to look at this more. So pelvic congestion syndrome was diagnosed or, or symptoms were put together and it was called pelvic congestion in 1949. So since 1949, we've been calling something pelvic congestion syndrome. There are studies in the 20s, the 30s, the 60s, the 70s, little ones in vascular journals, and all of the stuff that has been done with um, the vein world. In 2019, we're still saying the etiology is poorly understood, likely it's multifactorial, it may, contrib it may be 30% uh, of patients who are presenting with chronic pelvic pain have pelvic congestion, but because of a lack of methodologic consistency, robust data, we just don't know what to do with it. So we need to make physicians more aware. 
So this is where we are. If from 1949 we first identified it and we keep calling it pelvic congestion and, and saying that it's possible, we still don't know what to do with it as gynecologists. Differential diagnosis by organ system. Pelvic congestion is in the bottom of the gynecologic category. We have our zebras down on the bottom. But the top three are gynecologic, urologic, and GI. I propose that we should have a vascular section down there so that we can pull pelvic congestion syndrome out of the whole mix of gynecologic etiologies. These patients are significantly um, affected by their disease. Can you imagine having pelvic pain almost every day for more than a year? And you go to the doctor and they say, God, we just don't know what it's due to, but let's talk about pain medication. These are our possibilities for uh, treating chronic pelvic pain with medication. We can put a lapros laparoscope in and we can see veins like this, like this, and we still put pelvic congestion syndrome on the bottom of our differential diagnosis. These women are more medicated, more surgerized, and more likely to end up with a hysterectomy because we don't know what to do to help them. They, and not to make light of the psychologic component of what happens with these women, they are more likely to be depressed. They are more likely to have a lower quality of life. And for anybody who's having chronic pelvic pain, I think chronic uh, pelvic pain of venous origin really hasn't been well diagnosed because we just don't know how to diagnose it. And then if we do see dilated veins, gynecologists just didn't know what to do with it. Go back to the medications, and there was actually a study, at least one, this one in 2001, that said, you know what, GnRH agonists are good for pelvic congestion, probably better than DMPA. The pain relief lasts longer. I was a GYN practicing in 2001. I never heard about pelvic congestion and, and using um, GnRH agonists. So we still, we list it as an option, but the general gynecology world just really doesn't know about it. So all of these medications are kind of temporary measures. And you take a patient who's unhappy and in pain, and you give her hot flashes, night sweats, moodiness, irritability, um, fertility suppression, irregular bleeding. This is not the right long-term management for most patients. ACOG says this is what we should do when we have patients with chronic pelvic pain. We need to exclude other options and maybe some of these medications and of course hysterectomy. Hysterectomy should not be taken lightly either. These are all the different possible complications you can have of a hysterectomy. Granted your hysterectomy age, early 30s, mid 30s, not really the right time to do this. So pelvic venous evaluation needs to be in here somewhere. I suggest at least before you start getting into talking about a hysterectomy, but I really think that it needs to go up to the top. A pelvic sonogram. Um, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, the GYN should look and, and find these veins. You know what? We don't. And our, uh, our radiologists haven't been as good with looking at them and saying, oh, there are big, you know, veins crossing the pelvis here. So I think getting a good pelvic ultrasound should be part of the initial. So even if you're not going to stent somebody, you know that this is a possibility and you can tell patients, you know what, you do have something going on. So for my conclusion, this is not something that the gynecologists are going to figure out on their own. ACOG is way, way out here. Um, you need a center for pelvic pain of venous origin. You need somebody to help direct what this is and how patients need to be assessed, evaluated, and treated. And it's up to everybody in this room to educate your gynecologists on what they're missing. And generalists, having 10 or 15 minutes you know, to treat somebody with pelvic pain and do their pills and talk about what's going on with their next pregnancy, 10, 15 minutes is not enough time to get a good history on these patients. And even our specialists who are uh, specialized in chronic pelvic pain, you can't find enough of them who've actually given credit to this. So it's incumbent upon all you guys to get out there and educate your gynecologists. Thank you.